and welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Pipe Workshop at the Bedrosian Center here in the Price School at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Pipe Collaborative. Our workshop speaker today is Professor Randall Walsh. Randy is a professor and director of the Masters of Science and Quantitative Economics program in the Department of Economics at the University of Pittsburgh. He is also a research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research. His research focuses on urban and environmental economics. In more recent work, he's been particularly interested in examining these issues through the lenses of economic history and political economy. He's published his work in a variety of journals, including the Journal of Law, Economics, and Organization, Journal of Developmental Economics, the Journal of Urban Economics, and the American Economic Review. Randy's presentation today is entitled, Using Digitized Newspapers to Refine Historical Measures, The Case of the Bull Weevil. Following the presentation, we'll have a formal discussion. James Feigenbaum, Assistant Professor of Economics at Boston University, to provide some comments. During Randy's talk, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat or Q&A box. I'll be monitoring questions as the talk goes on. And without further ado, I give you Professor Randall Walsh. All right. Well, um, first off, yeah, thanks to Jeff, the Bedrosian Center, and the Pipe Collaborative for, for having me. And, and also a big thanks to James for taking the time to, to act as my discussant. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Let me see if I can make my technology work. Uh, you know, I'm doing pretty well today so far. All right. So I should start by saying this is kind of a strange paper for me. It, it, uh, it grew out of a collaboration uh, that my colleague Andy Ferrara here in Pitt have with one of our PhD students, uh, Zhang Ha. Um, he was talking about doing some stuff. He was interested in looking at the, the impact of the boll weevil on... Um, on, on uh, black white violence in the South. And he, he, he was like, well, I think I can use newspaper, I can use newspaper, newspaper data to identify instances of violence. And so he was looking beyond, uh, he was hoping to look beyond, um, beyond lynchings and murders and, and assaults and things like that. And, and we were like, well, wait a minute, let's back up. You know, um, we, you know, wanted to make sure we could actually, um, measure the spread of the bull weevil with the newspapers. We thought that might be easier to measure than the, than the, the instances of violence that, that, that Zhang Hao wanted to look at. And then we got to thinking about uh, sort of more broadly ab about these newspaper databases, because we were able to do pretty well with the bull weevil about more broadly about the role that, that newspaper-based data could, could play to strengthen the, the quality of historical data. And in, in particular, uh, dealing with the the problem of measurement error, right? Because when you think about pretty historical data, a lot of times we've got some measures of what we want to measure, but it's measured with error. And, and you know, traditionally that's associated with a, a problem of attenuation bias and or an ordinary least squares estimators. And you know, the the typical solution to this problem, right, is to come up with another noisy measure. Uh, and then use that as an instrument. And and in, in that setting, you can get rid of this problem of of measurement error. And I promise there won't be a whole lot of these sort of slides in the talk, but I'll spend just a little bit of time on the math, right? So um, essentially when, you know, this we've got this true value, this true effect X star, we'd like to see the impact of, but what we can measure is X1, which was this X star measured with error, this U term, uh, right, right here, this U, this U term, right? When we have this noisy measure and we put it in, an, ordinary least squares regression, the beta hat, the estimate that we get is going to be the true beta, this beta right here, right? Times the variance of X star divided by the variance of X star plus the variance of U. And so the noisier this thing is, the more attenuated, the more noise there is, the more attenuated our estimate is going to be. Um, but if we have some other variable, we'll call it X2, which is another measurement of this thing X star, which we really want to measure, that's also measured with error. In this case, it's, it's measurement E. If we do the traditional sort of two-stage least squares instrumental variable approach to estimation, the beta we recover will be the true beta um, that's being distorted by the covariance of U and E. And so if these, 
if this measurement error is uncorrelated, the, the error between X2 and what we want X star and the error between X1 and what we want, if those are uncorrelated, then that covariance is zero and we're going to get the true estimate. And that, that, that's the basic idea that underlines, un underlies using instrumental variables as a way to deal with the problem uh, of measurement error, right? Of course, the, the, the challenge is that we've, we've got to be able to come up with some you know, affordable uh, and feasible source of a, of, a second, of, a, of a second measure, right? And so what we're going to do in this paper, using the example of the bull weevil, we're going to show how, how uh, digitized newspapers and the two big sources right now are Chronically America and newspapers.com, how those digitized newspaper sources can be used to develop this second measure and that uh, we can then address that issue, right? And um, we're gonna talk about X1 being continuous or binary. The example I just showed you is only gonna work when X1 is continuous, right? Uh, if that thing that's measured with error is binary, for instance, the year of the arrival, is, has the bull weevil arrived or not? As, as the boy went to arrive, then this class, this this approach is not going to work, right? Um, and so, in this case, whether it's a binary variable, discrete or bounded, we don't have classical measurement error, and this classical uh, approach isn't going to work. And we're also going to talk about about three ways uh, to deal with that. But for the most part, don't again, don't get worried. This is going to be all about uh, econometric IV. I need to quickly give you some framework, but at the end of the day, we're just going to show you how well the newspaper data works. We're going to show you three ways we could think about getting around this problem for binary variables where the, where the uh, approach, the classical approach of IV doesn't work. One is set identification, and, and all that means is we're going to show you that, that the OLS estimator and the IV estimators are going to sandwich the true estimator, right? So one thing we could do is we know the IV is actually going to be biased upward when we've got a binary regressor. OLS is biased downward. So the true value will be trapped between those two estimates. And so we can bound the, the, the estimate. I'm not gonna spend much time on that, but that'll show up in, in, in our results. The second thing that we can do is we can not get truth per se, but we can really significantly reduce the error by using what we're calling the agreement sample. So I've got two measures uh, of, of, the, of the arrival of the bowl, we will X1 and X2. If I only use uh, if I only use observations where those two agree, right? Then I can greatly I'll show you we can greatly reduce the error as well there. And then finally, um, we can actually show you uh, there's a we can do a parametric bias correction. We can actually use the OLS and IV estimates to to give a uh, with just a little bit of math to re to recover a beta that is is probably the that is under certain assumptions going to be the true value of beta, right? And again. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Most of the time I'm going to spend today is going to be on, on approach two, which is the agreement sample. Meaning what we're going to do is we're going to have two measures of two noisy measures of is the bowl weevil here yet or not. And we're going to only use those measures, only use those observations where both data sets agree. And we're going to do that because for some of the things we want to replicate, um, the, the setup is a little more complicated than what I just showed you. And the math about set identification and the parametric bias correction doesn't actually, technically it doesn't work. The actual approach looks like it works, but we don't have a, a mathematical proof of that. So that's where we're gonna go. As I said, we're gonna, um, we're gonna apply this method to the arrival of the bull weevil. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that. The bull weevil is this cotton eating pest that arrives in the South uh, in the 1890s and spreads across the South uh, over the course of something like 30 years. And uh, a ton of researchers, including James, uh, have measured that spread based on a map the USDA uh, put together. Um, the dates on the map are good, but imperfect. And I'll talk about that just a little bit. But one thing I wanna be really clear about the point of this paper is not to call into question the work that folks are doing with the USDA map. And in fact, you're going to see at the end of the day, we're going to show that the two papers we're going to replicate, you know, did a fine job. They're going to survive the replication. But what we are also going to show is that by using our approach with an instrument, we actually get more robust. We get bigger results. And we're also going to show that you could have done this research just 
based only on the math, uh, excuse me, on the on the newspaper data we put together, and it got roughly the same results. And so we're demonstrating in a in a in a place where we have a pretty good measure of what we care about the usefulness potentially of newspapers in a place where we wouldn't have that have those maps, right? And so why are the dates and the maps uh, good but imperfect? Well, when you look closely at the map, there are some places where the, and I'll show you the map in a second, where the lines on these maps which show the spread actually cross and um, they show arrival, but not the impact uh, of, the, um, of the pest. So we're gonna replicate two, two recent papers, both of which we think quite highly of. One is by Karen Clay and her co-authors that looks at the impact of the arrival of the boll weevil in reducing pellagra deaths. It's kind of one of these interesting unintended consequences. Uh, the boll weevil a lot arrives in, in um, North Carolina, in the Carolinas. Um, all of a sudden, folks switch from growing cotton, which is being negatively impacted by the boll weevil, to a broader range of food crops because they've moved, shifted from cotton to food crops, they actually, the nutritional intake of people in these states gets better because now they've got access to a, a, a lot of food crops didn't have before. And as a result, pellagra, which is a nutritional disease, right? Cases go down and pellagra deaths go down. Um, the other study is Agar et al. Agar et al. is looking at the impact of the boll weevil uh, across the entire South. Uh, what happens, the boll weevil comes in and you see a reduction in cotton production, both in terms of productivity and in acreage and you see a switch towards corn, and you also see some out-migration and stuff like that. So we're gonna, we're gonna replicate those two things. Um, and we're gonna get bigger and more precise estimates in most of the cases where we use our instrument. And also, I'm gonna say this a couple of times over the course of the talk, uh, it's kind of cool that you could actually have done this work with just the newspaper data alone and gotten the same basic results. It suggests that for a lot of things we might want to measure, but would have thought we didn't have data for, we may be able to use historical newspapers going back at least to the beginning of the 20th century. No talk about the boll weevil would be complete if I didn't show you a picture of this ugly little bug. Um, and uh, so here you have sort of from 1914, an ugly picture of this, of this pest that really comes in is and wreaks havoc on cotton production. So as I said, it spread between the 1892 and 1922. Um, by 1922, all of the cotton growing regions in the U.S. had been infested. And, you know, within five years of arrival, the boll weevil total cotton production falls something like order of 40 to 50 percent. Um, and, you know, it's a large shock. It affects approximately 22 percent of the U.S. population at the time and three quarters of the southern black population um, are in areas that are that are hit by the boll weevil. Now, here's the map. Right. So. If you, if you look at this map, you can see the years are the years of arrival. And you'll notice as you move from sort of from Texas and the Mexico, border, southern Texas, right, arrives in southern Texas in 1892, sort of moves its way north and then spreads east and, and to the northeast, right? And finally gets to the limit of the cotton growing belt where most of the cotton is being grown in 1922, right? And so, so the exercise that, that folks are doing in Agar et al. And, and in Clay et al. is there creating data essentially ones and zeros by year is the, is the bowl we will hear or not. And then they're looking at, out, at outcomes related to that. If we zoom in a little bit though, you'll see there are some imperfections in the map, right? So this is um, this red, inside this red box, the square in the center here. Up here, we see the 1908 line and the 1910 line crossing each other, right? So there are some places where where it's, those are some problems. You see the same thing happening over here in the in the northwest corner of the map. And so there's some, again, I want to be clear, the point of this paper is not to call into question work that's done using this map, but just to highlight there, there are some, there's some room to maybe do better with, with the map and some reasons to think there might be error, right? And um, the other thing is, even if the map was perfect about the arrival date of the boll weevil, right? There's a, there's a gap between the date of the arrival and the date of impact, right? And so we think there's a good chance that, um, and what really matters probably is the date of impact. We think there's a good chance that, um, that using the newspaper data will, will maybe, you know, and we'll talk about how we do that in just a second, may do a, a better job of aligning with when the impact um, was maximized, right? And this is just a quote from Lang et al. talking uh, specifically about about this, this issue. 
here's some more on this. I love these old maps. Anytime you can show people old maps, you have to do it, right? So here's an old map of Mississippi showing uh, the spread 1907, 1908, and 1909, and then talking about the three counties that are outlined in red here in the map, right? And we added all, the, the, the highlighting and the outlining was added by us, right? That wasn't the original uh, document, right? So essentially for these three counties, they're saying the bull weevil arrives in 1909, but it arrives too late to have done any damage in 1909, right? So we would expect damage was gonna start to happen uh, in 1910. Right. And so this slide is, is, is again, just, uh, you know, replicating what I've already said to you. The key thing here being that the newspapers may actually do a better job of, of uh, on some level. The newspapers are going to be rough because the measurement is going to be rough. But what we're measuring in the newspapers may actually be more in line um, with, uh, with the settings of the bull weevil's arrival. All right. So, you know, digitized newspapers. So there's been this huge explosion of digitized newspapers going back into the 19th century, um, you know, and uh, kind of obvious, I would, I guess. But, you know, in the 19th and early 20th century, they were the primary source of information on newspapers, no TV. Um, they published a lot of articles at the Bull Weevil's arrival. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our hypothesis is that newspapers report more articles about the Bull Weevil when they arrive and when the damage is caused by the damage caused by the bull weevil is starting to have real impact, right? And so we're gonna work with the newspapers.com database. We're gonna test this hypothesis and then we're gonna go ahead once we show that this seems to be working quite well, we're gonna go ahead and use it in our, in our, in our replication exercises. All right, so what did we did, do? So we scraped uh, newspapers.com and constructed the following measures state by state. So what we did was we looked for, say I'm looking at Marion County in Mississippi. We're going to look for the number of newspaper by year in Mississippi. We're going to look for the number of newspaper pages that mention the word bull weevil and have Marion County in the name. Then we're going to divide those mentions by the total number of newspaper pages that mention Marion County. In other words, so we want to adjust for, you know, certain counties are gonna get a lot more attention in newspapers in the state. And so by dividing by the total number of newspaper pages in that year that mentioned that county name, we're, we're adjusting uh, for that, that, that different propensity for the county in general to be, um, be mentioned. And, and we can't just look at newspapers in a given, in that county, because we just don't have newspapers in all the counties back then, right? So we have to, we have to broaden out across the entire state. And, we thought about crossing state boundaries, but then you've got to worry. There are a lot of Jefferson counties in the South, for instance, right? And so, you know, you have to, you have to worry about uh, that problem. So by trying to stay in the state, uh, we work to overcome that. And, and in truth, we're actually going to work with moving average of this number, as, as I'll tell you in just a second. Um, so our sample is going to be a county year panel uh, for all the counties in 13 southern states from 1882 to 1932. Um, and there are going to be, we're going to go after 1922 again, because in some cases we think the impact of the bull weevil is happening after the, after the arrival. Um, and we're going to, um, uh, look at 911 infested counties, uh, total in the, uh, that are on the USDA map. So here, um, is an example for Marion County. It's kind of two, two articles that show up talking about the bull weevil, uh, arriving in Marion County. So we have both the word bull weevil and the word Marion County, and they're both in the same uh, article. We, we spent a bunch of time thinking about, well, should we want those words to be close to each other in terms of a distance on the page? And at the end of the day, we weren't able to really do much better by trying to get clever about it, which is maybe that's a blessing because it means that we're not spending our time trying to do that. So this- And Randy, you're not, you're not measuring direction here, right? In any sense. No. Uh, so if you had a, if, it, if that article said bull weevil has not yet reached Marion County, you would count that. We would count that. That's right. Um, and it would be really hard to do more. I mean, for the part of the part of the attractiveness of what we're doing is it's pretty cheap and easy. I mean, relative, when I say cheap, it didn't take that much of our graduate students time to do this that much, meaning maybe maybe less than a month. Right. So it was some work and even at how little we pay our graduate students, it still can add up. But it, you could, you could, depending on what you're doing, you could conceivably go back and and identify the set of articles and then look at all of them, right? 
that would that would increase the cost by the way a factor of five or something but for some things that really might make sense to do right depending on your your application but here here everything is automated there's no we're actually in this paper we were doing other than we spent a lot of time you know sort of ground truthing short you know small samples to understand what we were getting and to try to figure out what we could do if anything to optimize but everything that we're going to show you is, is totally optimized there's no human intervention after the fact yeah that's that's a that's a really good point um all right so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do an event study to sort of to see how the map relates to salience in the in the news and so what we're gonna do is run it this is traditional uh event study essentially we're gonna regress the percent of the boll weevil on a set of indicators for um, time relative to when the map in that county says that the, says that the boll weevil arrived, right? So we're gonna do 10 leads and 10 lags, and we're gonna control for county fixed effects and, and state by year fixed effects. And then we're just gonna take a look at uh, the results and we're gonna stand to the errors we're going to standards are going to be clustered at the county level, and um, because this is sort of a classic two-way fixed effects problem, we're also going to do the uh, sudden Abraham two-way fixed effect uh, correction. So, what this is showing you, you can look at either the orange dots or the or the or the red diamonds. It's telling you the same story: is that we don't see we see a pretty low level of the um, bull wheel appearing in newspapers until the USDA map says it it has arrived, right? And then typically we think we max out at one or two years after the, the map, map says it's going, it's going to arrive here in terms of the, the coefficient, depending on which one you look at. But, but clearly there's some, some real signal in the newspaper articles here, right? If, if you looked at this and you were trying to figure out based just on when the, uh, when the, when the Bowie will arrive just based on the newspaper data, on average, at least you would do pretty well, right? So it seems like it seems like things things are working okay. All right. So because there's noise in in the newspapers, right, um, and they can jump around, and I'll show you an example in a second. What we're actually going to use is we're going to use the five. We're going to look for the maximum of the five year moving average for the measure we're going to use, and, and all the replications I show you. If I have time, I'll show you some sensitivity analysis. There are a lot of different ways we could try to to choose our, our, our year and. And uh, our results are really robust to seven year moving averages, three year moving, a bunch of different things that we could we could try. And like I say, if I have time, I'll show you that picture. If not, it's it's in the paper, it's in, in the paper. But this is what's gonna be in, in in what I show you. And so this is showing you both just the raw data for Marion County and um and then also the five year moving average. And so what you can see here is that the five year moving average in Marion County. Is going to reach uh, its max one year after um, the USDA map. And if you remember, Marion County is one of the ones we zoomed in on, where uh, the beetle the beetle arrives in 1909. Um, but at the time, folks are saying probably not time for it to have any real impact in 1909. And what we're seeing is the newspaper data. You know, we peak both in the raw data, the dotted line here, and in the moving average data right there one year later. And we can look, this is the distribution of our predicted arrival uh, relative to the USDA map across the entire sample, right? So one year, one year after is the, is the most uh, common result we get. Two years after would be the second most common. And then um, the exact same date would be third. And generally we're seeing uh, predicted arrival dates from the, um, from the newspaper data just a little bit later. And so what we're doing essentially when we look at the agreement sample is that we're we're pushing we're pushing the date of arrival back a little bit, right? When we estimate things. All right, so we're gonna do some math again, right? I already showed you this is this is just if if we were using continuous variables, we would be in this IV setting. We're not there in our data here because both of these papers are using a one zero for is the bull weevil. Uh, there or not. So um, we're going to be in this world uh, where we have measurement error in a binary uh, variable. And, and basically, our OLS estimate is going to be biased downward uh, 
based on how many observations are mis, misclassified or mis, uh, they miscategorized. So how many ones are reported as zeros and how many zeros are reported as one? And that's what this theta is, right? So as the share of misclassified operation, uh, observations goes up, my beta estimate uh, is going down, right? Um, in our world, we're gonna have two measures, beta one, beta X one, sorry, and X two, right? Both of which I have some misclassification. Um, let's just assume for the time being, for convenience that gamma is smaller, meaning that X two has got, got fewer misclassifications than X one. In that case, right, the beta hat estimate with X2, which is measured with less error, is going to be bigger than beta one, right? Because gamma is going to be smaller. And so this attenuation bias is, is, is going to be smaller, right? So we'll get this result here that if, if gamma is the better, or X2 is the better measure, our beta for X2 is going to be bigger than our beta for X1, both of which are going to be biased downward, right? Now, it turns out, um, that if we instrument for X1 with X2 or the other way around, in a case where we've got a binary variable, we actually, uh, we now go to a situation where we're overestimating. So the beta hat IV, the IV estimate with the binary um, dependent variable is actually gonna be overstated, it's gonna be inflated upwards, right? And it, the, um, the variable with the larger measurement error um, this beta one minus theta, which is based on X one, the one that's got a larger classification error is gonna be, because theta is gonna be bigger, I'm gonna be dividing by a smaller number that the estimate based on the noisier measure is actually in the IV state situation is gonna be larger, right? So the noisier measure is gonna have a larger IV estimate biased upwards, a smaller OLS estimate, which is biased downwards. And then the less measure, measure less messy or less uh, less noisy measure is gonna, OLS is gonna be less attenuated, but still too low and, and IV is gonna be less inflated, but, but not by as much, right? So neither OLS or IV are gonna give us unbiased estimates, but I'm starting to get, I'm starting to get some bounds, right? I know that beta is gonna be between the OLS estimates and the IV estimates, right? So if I've got, two OLS estimates and two IV estimates, I can, and I don't know which is measured with most error. I, you know, the theory says that the true beta is gonna be between the, the, the lower of the IV estimates and the larger of the OLS estimates. And so that's, that's the bounding uh, approach one could take. Um, and this is that right here. This is that set estimate estimate. It turns out if I wanna do a lot of math and don't worry about the math, you can read it if you want to. Having, uh, having both the IV and the OLS estimates, I can actually, um, I can actually recover the true beta, right, from that uh, and use the delta, doing some algebra and use the delta method uh, to com compute standard errors. We'll, we'll do that a couple times later. Um, and so we have this overall result that the uh, um, beta, wait a second, I just skipped something right here. Yeah, um, I just got lost. This is, this is the bias correction, right? The third approach I wanted to talk about, right, is right here, right? The third thing we can do, if we think about the agreement sample, right? If the if the if the measurement error, the misclassification of the two variables is uh, um, is independent, right? Then the misclassification rate is going to be the multiplication of those two numbers, right? So imagine that in as an example, thirty percent of the observations of X one are misclassified, and twenty percent of X two are misclassified that's gonna cause us to have a 20 or 30% right, um, attenuation of the coefficient estimate, but the agreement sample, the, the misclassification will be the product of those two. So that 0.3 and that 0.2 multiply together to give me 0.06. Now, of course, there's no way for me you know, to know what the true classification rates are, but this is just showing you if I limit my attention to the places where the two data sets agree, in principle, I can greatly reduce the attenuation bias from that misclassification because in the agreement set, the level of misclassification is gonna be much lower if the misclassification is happening independent of one another in the two data sets. So let me just take a, a break there and see if anybody has any questions before I, I go boldly, boldly forward. I typed a few in that were really about, you know, just trying to get a good estimate of how often 
um, papers are reporting, you know, we'll, you know, just basically the reportage itself. And, you know, we don't have to do these now. We could do these at the end. Yeah, but. Um, they're report. I think I might have a figure in here. They're reporting a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the bull so, weevil is, is sort of the big, I mean, cotton, the, the economy in the South is based on cotton and the bull weevil is cutting production by 40 to 50%. So there are lots of newspapers in the South at this time that we have data for, and there's a lot of reporting going on. And, and you, you pretty regularly get, um, pretty regularly get summary articles too, that will list the, the counties where the bull weevil has ar arrived, arisen, arrived. And, and um, so there's a pretty good coverage. I don't, the numbers are in the paper. I don't know if I have them in the slides or not. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, a couple though. So what if, what if stories are syndicated? during this time? Are you effectively double counting at that uh, point? We would be if they were syndicated. I don't, we don't see any evidence of syndication on these stories. Okay. I mean, I can't tell you it's not happening, but I can tell you we've looked at a lot of them, a small fraction of all the ones we're using, but we've, I've probably looked at a hundred of these stories and nothing looks like it's being syndicated. Although it wouldn't surprise me if it isn't coming from the same sort of it, it, it may be coming from the same underlying source quite often, right? Yeah. A lot of times, though, it depends. A lot of them will also will be talking about neighboring counties, right? So I'm three counties away, and they'll be recorded, reporting that the bull weevil is getting close because it just arrived in Marion County, and I'm two counties north of Marion County. Um, but that's, a, that's a potential issue for sure. So, so across the south, you have some states that have a lot of counties, and some that don't have very many at all, right? So Texas is about 250. Um, uh, I think Pretty Georgia, big. yeah, Georgia has 80 or 90, I yeah. think. And some of the others are down. Does that matter at all in terms of um, coverage? All of this stuff would matter a, a little bit. I mean, the issue is probably less the number of counties and the, if the average size of the counties were varying, I'd be more worried about. So the Texas, Georgia, in fact, most of these counties, if you... I mean, so the thing we're going to worry about, and I think the counties are, are where is it? Right, you can, ah, you know, what I'm worried about is other size of the counties the same. And so if I look at this map, I, I might be worried about Southern Florida, although I don't think they're that important in the story. But for most of these, the, the average size of the counties is actually pretty common. What's, what's going to matter more is probably going to be the newspaper density, right? Yes. And that is, that, that is and, and that's going to be related to population density in some way and, and other things. And, and that is going to vary. And also what's going to matter is um, how equally these newspapers have been digitized because they're not all digitized, right? And so, um, and, and that's why the adjustment we're doing, I think the adjustment we're doing, which asks what's the number of times that the county is mentioned in that year in, in newspapers is going to account, you know, on average, I think. But what it's going to mean too is that there's going to be heteroscedasticity, right? So, some counties, the measurement is going to be a lot noisier than other counties, and I don't, I don't know what we would do about that. Um, yeah. yeah. What do you do? What do you do when you're looking at a state's paper that mentions counties from another state? We're mismeasuring. Yeah, we're we're mismeasuring. It would be, um, you know, especially if a if a paper, you know, is essentially covering a portion of the state that's in a corner, right, or near a border. Right. You're going to have that spillover if, if, if they're covering a county with the same name. Right. So if there are two Jefferson counties that are both on either side of the Mississippi, Alabama border, we're liable, going to liable, going to have noise in there. Right. And and we really so don't. I, have I, noise. I actually take Jeff's point a little different. Like like if uh, if there's a county whose main coverage is from across the border. Oh, then, we'll, then, then, then we won't pick that up also. But yeah, our measurement, our, our attempt to control for how often that county is showing up in newspapers will, in principle, adjust for that. Again, it won't solve the heteroscedasticity problem. It won't solve the problem that we may have a very low number of observations in that county. But on average, we probably ought to get close. I mean, there's some space, there's some other issues, but on average, we should, should get close, right? I mean, I can tell stories yeah. where newspapers farther away are going to be less likely to cover, for, given the amount of coverage I have on Marion County, if I'm farther away, I might be less likely to cover bull weevil than I would a murder or something like that. So then <laughs> there could be some other sort of second orders. But again, it's 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 okay if this measure is noisy. That's the thing about that's the thing about the IV or the or the bias correction or the it, it's. 
it, you know, it's going to increase the noise of our estimates, but in principle, just uncorrelated noise is going to make us less precise, but it's not going to bias us. That, that, that's not to say there couldn't be stories related to the issues that you're raising that could lead to bias, but just the pure noisiness in of itself shouldn't cause problems. I'll, I'll shut up because I know I have my own special time in a minute, but um, I, this isn't going to be in my discussion. I, I think Jeff's raising a bunch of points that practitioners and future referees are going to be worried about, not for you guys, but for people who maybe implement your methods right. in like what's in the newspaper data, weirdness in the newspaper data. And I think you guys will do, do your future users, I guess, a really good service if you think carefully about, you know, ways you can obviously, you know, ways you not quite address, but ways you can probe or test how much or how little, ideally, the newspaper weirdness matters to anything downstream. Um, I think the last thing you said, like, if it's all just noise, that's okay. If it's all just random noise, that's fine. Is like, a, you should scream that a little louder in the paper. Uh, future users and then future referees will appreciate that. Yeah, that's a great comment. Thanks. I'm just quickly making notes. Cool. All right. Yeah, no, those are very fair points. All right, I have seven minutes left. I, I could make it. You could, you could have as, as you know. We've interrupted you. You should take, you should take more than that. That's all right. That's all right. I'm, I'm going at the pace I want. Um, okay. We can see how much of a, of, a, of a taste we have for for some other things later. Um, so our our first replication is going to be this paper by Clay et al. It's looking at mole weevil infestation in North Carolina and South Carolina. It's their sample is annual data from 1915 to 1925. So. We move from cotton, when cotton gets wiped out, to niacin-rich food production. And villagra is a disease that results because of a lack of niacin. Economists love this kind of story, right? Unintended consequence. And in this paper, it's a really neat paper. They show that the death rates due to pellagra drop pretty significantly. Um, they're going to run two specifications that are both related to what I show you here. They're going to... They're gonna, um, regress to the log of pellagra and death rates in pellagra on arrival of the boll weevil. And then also in most, but not all specifications, they're gonna add boll weevil times a measure of, of cotton intensity. And their measure of a constant cotton intensity is gonna be a one zero for, are you um, above the 75th percentile in cotton production in their sample? And you know all the math I just showed you um, is really only, you know, other than the agreement sample stuff, which should work no matter what, um, is only good uh, when we think about um, having just the straight up bull weevil, right? When we when we add this second intensity measure and when we get to the agar at all, it's all gonna be involved in the intensity measure. We ha have to actually think about instrumenting for both of these. We can't, we can't construct our estimate of the, um, we can't construct our estimate of the, um, bias correction calculation in, in that setting. And while it turns out that that ordering I showed you of the IV and the agreement sample and OLS actually holds pretty well uh, in these interaction models, we don't have a strong a theoretical foundation there. So I'm gonna spend most of my time focusing on the agreement sample uh, estimation. I, think that's, I also think that's more flexible. It's, a, it's almost no matter what you're doing, you should be able to implement that, right? And, uh, so let me um, say that in this uh, model, there's two different specifications, eight different specifications. Um, we're going to replicate all of them. Another another challenge, if we want to compare our results to their results, it's hard to make a two-dimensional comparison, like the data one and the data two. So what we're going to do, both here and in the Agar et al. paper, is that we're going to first show you the results at the at below the 75th percentile which means that this theta two doesn't come into a effect because uh, the intensity measure, this intensity measure here will be zero, right? And, and then we'll do the same thing for above the 75th percentile, where we're really gonna be showing you is the sum of theta one and theta two, right? To, to, com to it, it just makes it easier to compare, are we getting a bigger or smaller effect by seeing the combined, combined effect? Otherwise, you're gonna find almost always one of the parameters will be low, smaller, the other one will be bigger, but we really want to know about what the estimated total effect is going to be, and that's what we're going to that's what we're going to show you. Uh, so um, let me start. So this is our replication of their and, and and don't look at the whole thing. I'm going to talk through this, but this is our replication of their uh, entire uh, table of results. Columns one and five are the uninteracted 
columns. In other words, they're not they're not going to be including the interaction terms in those columns. And um, beta hat OS X1 would be our would be the the beta we get estimating that model using our using our newspaper data. So this result right here and this result right here is based purely on the newspaper data. Here is based on the map right here. So you can see that um, the OLS estimate based on the map data has got a bigger, uh, larger magnitude uh, than what we get on newspaper data. Um, this next column, these are the agreement samples. You'll see that the agreement sample um, is larger. All right, we get a larger point estimate. Here is the bias correction. We can only do this for these two models, columns one and columns five. This is where we actually know we got to have a, a, a theoretical expression for exactly how we can convert the IV estimates um, into uh, that estimate. And I want to highlight that they're very one thing we're really happy with here. It's just two data points, but that the agreement sample and the bias correction have very, very they're like four percent of four uh, percent apart. And then here are the IV estimates, which again are overestimates theoretically. And you'll see that um, we think here that our measure is noisier than their measure. And so you'll see that we get the lower OLS estimate and the bigger IV estimate, right? So the bounding estimate would say that we should be somewhere between minus 0.595 and somewhere between minus 0.283, right? And then here we actually have these, these, these actual estimates. And here, um, what I'm showing you here is just the first graphically, the first column, right? And the ordering for the fifth column, which are these are the two models they estimate where they don't include the interaction effect is exactly what we would expect. And we, actually, we don't know a priori which measure is gonna do better or worse. And in fact, when we turn to the Ager et al measure, we're gonna find that our measure actually does, generally does better than the Ager et al measure does, right? In terms of the OLS prediction, but in this case, for the Carolinas, the newspaper appears to be noisier. We get the smallest coefficient. Um, at least we are going to interpret the smaller coefficient and implies perhaps that it was noisier. Here is the um, the map data. Here is the um, the agreement sample data, which has still got noise, right? But we've multiplied the misclassification rates together, which means if we were at thirty and twenty, it goes down to six percent. Um, you'll notice. This is theoretically, this is the actual estimate, right? And we don't get much, we get a small attenuation, then the IV estimates are attenuating. And th th again, this is the exact um, pattern that we are seeing uh, in column five as well. So there's no difference. So we're just showing you uh, the one. All right, so um, a couple takeaways uh, from this data. First off, and I've already said this, but one thing that we think is really cool, except for column four, where we get a p-value of, of 0.11, for the, the below 75 percentile effect, you could have done this paper just with the newspaper data. And while you have some attenuation for sure, you still would have drawn the same basic conclusions, right? So we, we've argued amongst ourselves, should we be talking about instrumenting or just how great newspaper data can be, right? And I think there's two messages here. The other thing that I've already mentioned is that the, um, the agreement sample and the bias correction estimates, which is you know, theoretically, at least the bias corrected estimates are, are truth or, or are unbiased estimate of truth, right, are really quite close to one another, which, again, going forward, when we get into the Ager et al. stuff, we're really going to be leaning on the on the agreement sample. So um, that's that's important to us. Right. Um, and uh, the other thing is that in all models, the um, agreement sample estimates are highly significant and larger in magnitude. Right. So one takeaway from this could be, again, I wanna be clear, we think this is great work. We don't mean this as a critique of this paper at all, but it looks like the actual effects are, are, are larger um, than uh, what were estimated here or in uh, Agar et al. So Agar et al is looking at all of the Southern states. Here they're sampling roughly every five years, right? Which is, which is gonna be different. Um, and they're looking at, they're, they're primarily interested in the cotton and quantum economy, but they're going to look at a number of things, uh, not just cotton, but you're going to see a switch into corn and you're going to see out migration, right? So the basic model is almost exactly the same as in Clay et al., only here their interaction term is going to be the demeaned uh, level of cotton production, meaning that meaning if we look at gamma here, the coefficient of the boll weevil, 
what that is, is that's the estimated impact of the boll weevil for the average for a, for a county with the average level of cotton production in the sample, right? And what we're going to do to try to to combine both of them is that just so that it's comparable to what we did with clay at all, we're going to evaluate the sum of these two things um, at a 75th percentile. All right, I know this is noisy as can can be. Let me just slowly unpack this figure. So um, egg at all are going to estimate 12 different models, right? One, the, one looking at cotton, one looking at corn, and one looking at farm values and population changes, right? And um, we want to focus on uh, three, and, and the ta whole table's in the paper, but just for our discussion, I want to focus on the estimates based on the USDA map, which are in green. I want to look at the newspaper estimates, which are in gold, and then the agreement sample that are in purple. So this is showing uh, you the estimated effect at the mean, which means that if I come back to this equation, we're looking just at gamma, right? At the mean, this cotton indicator is going to be zero because what they're using for their cotton level is the D mean, right? So this will be zero at the mean. And so if we look at what's happening, what's happening when the boll weevil rises, cotton production goes down and it goes down in terms of the bales that are produced total in the county, the acres that are in production, the yield and the share, right? And all three models of the, are gonna agree, but you'll notice in all three cases actually uh, about the cotton economy, um, the newspaper uh, data has a stronger, uh, 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 a larger estimate. And the agreement sample has an even larger estimate. And in principle, right, it shouldn't matter which of the two measures is better in terms of yield, the new, the, the new, the new one, the, news, the newspaper one or the, or the map in terms of getting a larger estimate from the agreement sample, right? Because um, both of them are noisy. We don't know which is, which is noisy, but by look, focusing on the agreement sample, we're greatly reducing the noise, hopefully. Um, when I look at corn, so what's happening, I just love this paper, um, it's just pure economics, cotton becomes less productive by, by switching to corn, right? And so we increase the acreage of corn, the yield of corn goes down, right? Because now we're putting more marginal or farmers who have less experience growing corn or growing corn. Um, here, um, this I put a red X next to this one because our, our agreement sample actually gives you a slightly smaller estimate than the original estimate, right? So, so this is a, a mark against us. Um, we do better with the share. And then um, it's not clear, I'm, I'm, I walk away from this application. Yield is down, but acreage is up in general. Uh, everything we will agree on that. What's gonna happen to bushels? None of the estimates are significant here, so we don't know how to think about it. Um, and in terms of farm value, um, there on these on their other variables on just the main effect, um, agri at all never get a statistically significant impact. Um, we see uh, in the newspaper data a statistically significant reduction in the farm data, which is going to show up again, and in farm value that's going to show up when we interact everything. Um, we get a, a marginal positive effect on population, which seems kind of perverse and insignificant drops in the, the black population. So depending on how you count, six to eight of the 12 cases here are showing you a stronger, uh, bigger impact with the agreement sample and one slight weakening with the corn yield. But generally this suggests that our that our, our method is doing pretty well. This probably isn't the best uh, comparison for the agar at all paper. The best is probably to look at what's happening at the 75th percentile because a lot of their identification in our papers about what's happening in the really sort of cotton intense locations. So what we've done here is estimated the impact at the 75th of the arrival of the boll weevil or predicted at the 75th percentile, which is going to combine, that's going to combine, that's going to be this gamma coefficient here plus delta times the 75th percentile of, 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 of cotton production. And that's this map. And what you're going to see if I look at cotton production, everything I just described holds again. Um, we get a larger point estimate um, with the newspaper sample than than we do with the um, map sample. Maybe not surprising, right? Because it takes a while for the bull. You know, we've already talked about the. You know, we may be getting when the impact happens uh, better. Um, we we get a red X on bushels of corn. Um, they get the agar at all has a significant negative 
impact in both the newspaper and uh, interestingly, uh, and this sort of may not, I mean, it's not clear to us how we should think about the uh, value of, of either IV or the, um, or the agreement sample when, when the second measure doesn't measure anything. But um, on acres, right, we're doing, we actually move from being insignificant at the 95% level, right, to being significant in the right direction. Yield, we have the same result. Nothing's really changed with share. Uh, on farms, um, you know, they had a marginally significant uh, effect on the number of farms. We're seeing that that's just significant. Same thing on farm value. They had a marginally significant negative. We see a, a larger value there, although we don't, you know, in principle, you would have expected this purple line here to be actually even lower um, if everything was lining up right. Population, uh, slightly smaller. And then um, uh, I think this result is kind of, if I had been them and I had done this result and I had, had done this, this last thing as like a specification check and I found out that I got a statistically significant uh, uh, coefficient on the black population, I would have been pretty excited because part of the story about the great migration, this on some levels may be the most important coefficient in their paper, trying to understand the role of, uh, of the spread of the boll weevil on launching the great migration. And using newspaper data, you get a, a pretty, pretty unambiguously positive effect on, or out, on out migration or a negative effect on black population, right? So you're getting clear evidence uh, here where, where, where they didn't. Um, so those uh, those are, our, and I'll say here in 10, in 10 cases, the agreement sample leads to larger estimated impacts here. So it seems to be working pretty well. And again, we're not doing so well with corn bushels or corn yield. Um, so overall, uh, the coefficient patterns generally hold as the theory suggests. I didn't talk on that talk about that too much. Um, in the two cases where we could actually compare the agreement sample approach to the bias correction approach, you know, they varied very little by three and a half percent or 4.3 percent, depending on which column we looked at. And across both replications, if I only look at the places where I've got uh, significant coefficients, uh, we get an average increase uh, of 37% on the clay at all coefficients. Actually, all of those, everything significant. And then for the 15 cases in agar at all, um, where both data are yielding significant estimates, we get an, on average about a 50% increase in the magnitude, right? And, and again, that impact on black population actually if you ask it other than sort of methodologically, what is the one piece of new things we learned in this paper, I would say it's that coefficient on, on black population, right? Uh, and I think that historically is really quite important. Um, and the other thing is that the basic results from both those papers could have been replicated based solely on the newspaper data, right? Um, which I never would have believed going into this, right? <laughs> I, I was surprised by that. And again, None of this is intended in any way as a criticism of that earlier work. That earlier work is great on important and really interesting stuff. And it holds in, in overall, like I say, it holds up to the replication. If I was the, the authors of the other work, I'd be, I'd be happy with that. So I have some other stuff on when this would work and some, some stuff, but why don't I stop there? Because I'm at three minutes and 56, that three, three fifty six. So I think I, unless folks are really dying in to see uh, some sensitivity analysis and hear me talk more about what all this means, uh, I'll stop. I'll stop here and, and let James tell us what it really means. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Randy. Thank uh, you. James, we're going to turn that over to you now. And that's uh, perfect. Yeah. Cool. So thanks, Randy, for that uh, presentation and, and Jeff for the invite to, to do this. Um, this was sometimes you have to discuss a paper and it's a real drag. Um, and sometimes you have to discuss a paper, but you'll probably have to read it anyways, carefully in the future. Um, and so hopefully I can do this well enough that I can dodge refereeing it um, <laughs> going forward. Uh, we'll see. Um, cool. Okay. So this paper had sort of two goals, as, as Randy told us. One was to present this new method. Uh, it's basically going to uh, erase all of our attenuation bias and in historical crappy data. Um, and the other is to replicate the two papers on, on the bull weevil. And I'm actually going to talk, I'll talk about the second first, but, but not that much. Um, and then I really want to dig in on the method a bit. Um, so, so in terms of like, why did I, I get this job? Uh, obviously, I've got some bull weevil papers, Randy cited them, thanks. Um, I talk a lot about the bull weevil in other contexts that Jeff knows about. So this is my first ever post on Broad Street. Uh, 
probably got me into this. Um, and I even work with newspaper data. Um, so this is this is from a paper with Dan Gross about telephone operators that I think Randy's probably seen before, um, where we actually use newspapers to, to uh, figure out the timing of this technology shock across cities. Um, and turns out, yeah, like the idea to like use newspapers to validate data uh, sort of is floating out there, but but this new idea of you know creating a new measure with it and then actually doing something econometrically with it, I thought was really cool. Um, so I'm not an econometrician. So when I say I'm gonna talk about the method, that means I'm not gonna tell you anything with any math, um, but I'll try to talk about this as a practitioner, um, as a as a study of the bull weevil and then as a new method. Okay, so here's our, here's our hero of the bull weevil. Um, here's our map. I give this to my undergrads the first day of my economic history class and I have them guess what this is a map of. They're mostly always wrong. They say stuff about railroads and some, some know that I work on Sherman's March and so they talk about like war stuff. Um, and eventually they realize it's the, it's the bull weevil, but it is a really exciting and interesting map. And it's also like a, a crazy, it's a crazy map. It's hard to read, um, especially in black and white. And, and so I think Randy's right to ask the question of like, well, what happens if maps this one in particular, but maps in general that we use to, to sort of define treatment timing. Um, what if they're wrong sometimes? Um, James, a quick question here, just for the, the non bull yeah, weevil crowd out there like me. Uh, how, how did the USDA kind of draw these lines? What did they use to draw the lines? So that's that's an awesome question. So Randy's going to talk about that a little bit in the paper. He didn't give that so much in the, in the talk. And actually, that was one of the things I wanted to push a little bit more on. Um, and so actually, in a couple of slides, I will join you in asking Randy, how did the USDA draw these lines? And Randy um, had very little to say. <laughs> it, it wasn't newspapers, though, right? So th uh, that would be part of my question. But th in the paper, <laughs> at least, it is uh, strongly claimed that it is not newspapers. Yeah. But um it, it almost certainly would have been agricultural commissions, uh, yeah. agricultural commissioners. I mean, this is progressive era stuff. I mean, there would have been, they were paying attention to this stuff at the, at the state level. Yeah, just like, you know, basically uh, experts in, in local, each of these local areas, which I, I think is probably right. But but we'll, I'll, I'll come back to that at that point. Exactly. Um, so so the first thing I wanted to say, which is, again, specific to this case, to the, the case study, the bull weevil, is you're going to use the agreement sample, which I think is a neat method. Um, I like zooming in on it. Um, the thing that's a little weird here is we have, you know, you guys make a big deal of this in the paper. There's this laying it all idea that basically the map is sort of wrong from some perspective because the, the map shows you the year the bull weevil arrives. But if it shows up in August, it doesn't really matter. It actually should be T plus one instead of T. And you can actually see this. I didn't clip the, the figure from the paper. That histogram has a huge spike at like one, not at zero, I think. And so I, I just thought, you know, this might be a case where, where you don't want to do something so simple as to say, there's an agreement sample. This is a place where they agreed. Let's study it. But maybe a little bit more sort of domain-specific knowledge to be like, we're going to look at the places where it's either one year off or zero years off or zero years off or one off to the right or to the left or whatever. Like, like just, you know, more than, than a simple, uh, you know, difference does. Um you could even imagine doing something like, aha, here's the places where they agree perfectly. Here's the plus or minus one, the plus or minus two, whatever. Like you could make a pretty picture or an ugly picture, depending on your perspective. Um, is it agreement sample grows or shrinks? Does, does it actually, what happens to the estimate? Um, okay, so this is Jeff's question, the USDA maps. Uh, you guys say on page three, it, it's the USDA trained entomologist. You say later in the paper, it's again, you come back to the USDA trained entomologist, the, the trained entomologist, like several times you say this. Um, I sort of wanted like more evidence and detail on this, some proof, basically. Um, I think you're probably right. I, but, but it's also the case that like, you could imagine doing this retrospectively to figure out what year the Bowie will showed up in Marion County, or especially in those places in Texas where kind of, we didn't expect the bow evil to maybe be such a big deal. And we didn't get our act together to start studying it until 1910. How do we know exactly when between 1899 and 1910 things actually happened? Um, newspapers seem like a plausible story. Um, and so I think you just want to like be able to shut the door really solidly on this. And I think, again, this points to a more general problem or, or challenge to the approach that future practitioners will have to deal with is you've got to believe that the newspapers are uncorrelated with that original noisy measure. That's, this only works if the noise is uncorrelated. And that's that's not easy. It's not going to be always the easiest thing to to prove. Um, newspapers aren't just like sitting in some secret archive. They're like being read and digested by people at the time. Potentially, the people who did, who you know made the treatment variable that you start with. Um, 
Okay. Uh, I also didn't totally understand why you guys didn't also replicate the Lang et al. paper. I appreciate not going after any of my estimates. Um, but uh, that's like the first one. And it seems like the, the logical one to start with. Um, and then I had this other idea sort of for placebos, again, specific to the bull weevil. We know there's no bull weevil in Massachusetts or in, in I, I went where we're, we're all sitting right now, um, in any of our counties. And so what would happen if you ran your algorithm on places where we know the bull weevil never showed up? Do you get some false positives or does it look clean? Like what, what is the timing of the bull weevil across Illinois or Pennsylvania? Um, and, and could that be sort of a useful placebo test for something? Um, okay, now let me zoom in on the method. This is where I think it's really cool because this is something that I think people are in fact going to use, hopefully not just in more bull weevil papers because the field of bull weevil study is, is <laughs> as, a, as a practitioner of a bull weevil uh, of the field, it's getting too crowded, um, but hopefully for other stuff too. And so one way to sort of make this method something we can use beyond the bull weevil is, is treatment intensity, not just timing. And I think Jeff sort of mentioned this actually in, in the, what we were talking about an hour ago. Um, you know, usually we care a lot about treatment intensity, maybe more, maybe in addition to timing. Um, and, or maybe our identification strategy really relies on it. Um, you know, in the bull weevil literature, it's just this idea of like, we, we care about these counties that specialize in cotton. Um, and, but we don't know actually if the bull weevil was like worse in two different counties. We just know when it showed up. That's what your method tells us. And that's what the, the map tells us. Um, but could the sort of intensity of bull weevil coverage in the newspaper revealed that like a certain county actually got, for whatever random reasons, hit with even more of these pests than some other county. And similarly, like there's lots of other things we care to measure that are all about intensity and not about timing. Um, so so Brian and Walk, Brian Beach and Walker Hanlon have, have this paper, I'm sure that, that Randy knows about uh, Brad LaBassant about contraception. Um, uh, I think it's about contraceptive. Uh, and and it's, it, it's a trial. It happens once. So the timing is trivial, it's but it's, they use, yeah, it's about concept. I thought so. Um, uh, and, but, but the thing that they're really interested in is treatment variation across space. They want to know who, you know, where, when, and where do people learn about this? Um, and, you know, similarly, this is, this is from Hornbeck's Dust Bowl paper, where he's got, you know, low erosion, medium erosion, high erosion counties. We sort of know when the Dust Bowl happened, and actually timing isn't the interesting thing. What's interesting is how bad was it? But again, this map is made by, uh, I guess, USDA trained soil scientists, and maybe they got some stuff wrong, or maybe it was noisy, or maybe there's all the sorts of reasons the bull weevil map might be funky. This map could be funky too. And so can we use newspapers as a second measure? To, to help clean up maps like this? I think the answer is yes. I think the, the newspaper data can help us with treatment intensity, not just timing, but I'd be happier as a future user of this if you guys made that claim and then proved it uh, as opposed to like having to, to do it myself um, or to make one of my grad students do it. Um, and then the other thing in terms of the, sort of the, the direction of the method, and I think this is maybe even easier, is you're all about counties. And so we talked a little about some sort of systematic errors, like maybe there's some counties that are hard to search for. And I think you're right that most of this is going to sort of get washed out in, in random noise. And that's fine. The thing that I think is really on the sort of frontier, if you will, of, of when you think about counties uh, is why use counties? What about towns? And so, so uh, Enrico and Ezra and Peter have this really cool project, the Census Place Project, which I'll just give a plug for broadly, where basically the idea is we have a lot of county level data. We have some city level data. We don't have a lot of data at the, let's call it the town or call it the city for places that aren't really big cities. Um, they do a really, really good job of geolocating people in the complete count census from 1790 to 1940, or really from 1850 to 1940. Um, this is going to generate a lot of town level and city level outcome data that we didn't have before in like the classic Haynes County aggregates. Um, you might imagine there's outcomes in here, like, you know, at the end, we are talking about black population, like the black population share of a town instead of a county might be an interesting outcome. Um, the USDA map probably isn't going to give us town level data or not at least without a lot of noise. Um, but the newspaper data, I think, could zoom in below the county level. And so I, I guess just even you guys speculating about whether or not you can extend your method to count to towns within counties would be really cool. Um, and so, yeah, so for the bull weevil, it'd be awesome, but you can imagine doing it for lots of other stuff too. Um, also, you know, less, we're getting into the smaller fry stuff. 
Um, you know, the temporal frequency, you're building annual data, but newspapers are, are daily a lot of time or weekly. Um, can we do this at higher frequencies? Is this a trivial extension or is it really complicated? Um, again, I, I want you guys to think a little bit more of this paper as like, here's a new method, 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 method. Oh, by the way, it works in the Bowie case. Um, just because I think there's a lot of other stuff that this method could do. And, and the more of that you answer in this paper, the, the sort of more likely people are to use this in other circumstances. Um, and then the last thing I want to ask is, and maybe this is like the picky thing, is like I'm a little worried about newspapers sort of breaking the exclusion restriction, I think. Um, so basically, if it's in the papers, what does it matter if it's even true? Imagine some newspaper starts reporting that such some county got hit by the bull weevil five years before it actually did. Um, for whatever reason, er random error or noise or whatever, if that affects actual outcomes that we care about downstream, like in migration, I've never heard of this county, but I read in the paper that it got the bull weevil in, so I'm not going to move there. Um, or I'm not, I'm a bank and I'm not going to lend money to a farmer that lives there. Um, you know, the newspaper might have basically, it's an instrument. So we got to assume it's got an exclusion restriction. And what if that's broken? Um, and so maybe these are edge cases, but referees are jerks. And so this seems like the kind of edge case a referee comes up with. Um, and so just a little more thought about like how big of a problem this is gonna be. Um, and then there's just some small stuff that I'll send you later. Um, but that, yeah, awesome. But I, so my, my, my only biggest comment is, uh, this is weird for me to say, cause I love the bull weevil, but like this is a paper about a method that uses the bull weevil. It's not a bull weevil paper. And so, like your biggest returns, I think, are going to be reaching as many people as you can. But like, hey, you're a historian, economic historian or political scientist who dabbles, who does history, like, but you've got messy data. Uh, have I got the solution for you? Um, and I think you want to think about the, the various ways in which you can kind of extend that. Um, all right, I'm going to shut up now. Randy, did you want to respond at all to James? Yeah. Well, first off, James, thank you so much for the thoughtful comments. Um, I'll just respond to, to a, a couple of them. Um, you know, the, you've got to believe the, the instruments are uncorrelated. I actually don't need to believe they're uncorrelated. I just need to believe that there's some uncorrelated information. They're perfectly correlated, then I'm nowhere. But if they're, if, if correlation is, you know, I don't need that much uh, variation from, from me to be getting identification there. So I'm a little less worried about that. I think that what about the towns is just an awesome suggestion. And um, Jung may or may not be on the, on this call, uh, on the Zoom meeting, I'm not sure if he was going to make it, but if he is, uh, I'm sure he's sitting there going, I wonder how much work that's going to be. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that that's a great idea. Uh, we could certainly do higher frequency stuff um, in terms of the newspaper measures. There's going to be, um, but there's some limits, right? For, for one is, um, you know, you probably can't get, it'd have to be a pretty big event to go below like two weeks or something like that. Um, and you are getting something by aggregating over a year, you're, you're smoothing out a lot of noise. And so you certainly could do a higher frequency, but there's going to be cars yeah. that are going to show up pretty quickly. I, I think even, I think even rules of thumb from you guys in terms of how to think about this would be useful yeah. in the paper. Like, you know, like, yeah, just like basically a, a, a cleaner version of this sort of stuff you're speculating about, I think, yeah, would be, would be valuable. Yeah. And, um, and I think the I think that in principle one would want to be really worried about could newspapers have a direct effect. Um, I think I could make an argument why in the bull weevil that's in this context I'm not too worried about it. But I, as a general comment, I think that's really really right on. And um, I think your broader point about the methodological focus, which is the reason we I mean, we just had a conversation with someone the other day saying, please, no more bull weevil papers. And and I just gave a bull weevil paper, right? <laughs> Although I'm kind of excited about the, the impact on black uh, population. That's the one thing that's kind of valuable in there on, relative to bull weevil. But I agree. Um, I think we need to think harder about how we can strategically put some more energy on those, those on the, on the lines you're suggesting. I think they're right. The question is how much energy we have to do it. Um, but I think those are great comments. And Again, thanks. I really appreciate it. I had a few as, as James was giving his comments. I typed a, f a few thoughts in here. Um, one would be to kind of think beyond bull wheels, right? As, as James is asking you to do and you're resisting. Um, but um, so, you know, so to put it very bluntly, what's an example of a question where you wouldn't have a quote unquote map where you would have newspaper data, right? There, there, there would be something 
that involves something like a spread or some, you know, some some change across time in geographic coverage? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have some data on it. You, you mentioned, uh, you know, cholera outbreaks. We, we do have data on that, but we don't always have the data we want. Um, that would be one example. Um, so there would uh, there no. would be I mean there would be you know so that that leads me to 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 ask like a follow up question that is you know what what kind of what kind of issues underlying questions would would newspapers be good at answering right so probably during this time something involving like racial violence you're not going to find that reliably in newspapers in the south that's, that's a, we've tried that that's a heavy lift in newspapers yeah large natural disasters are going to be going to be good um yeah so so yeah so extreme yeah, they weather have to, they have to be they have to be pretty specific and and relatively important right the bull weevil was really pretty important the dust bowl spread i think would be yep. would be something you could do um you know turn the other way we have the map but i, I didn't mention this but i think james your your suggestion about um the city level or the town level is a great idea. We could do that. In fact, I had one slide in the in the presentation I pulled out that was about the bowl. We were talking about it arriving in a town, right? And I pulled it out because I didn't want to get into a debate about, well, that's a town and not a county. How are you dealing with that? But uh, and we could certainly do that a little bit harder because we got to keep track of more towns, right? And one thing, nice thing about counties is we have a nice list of them. But we could just go with the, we could, I'm sure we could just use the, um, we could just use the list that's in, you know, um, in the Burks at all paperwork, right? And we could just, you know, we could go right from that and we would be in good shape with that. Um, we need to think, we need to think more about that. Uh, racial animus, you mentioned, I think we think that would be a good one as well, right? Um, they have to be big events and, and events that are repeated events, right? Um, well, so that's, that's the question, I guess, uh, you know, I think that we, I don't think we have a decent measure. You know, we, we know for a bunch of big cities when the flu showed up in 1918, I don't think we know that at the small county level or the small town level, um, getting that timing right would be, would be a potential, I think, use of this method. Potentially, yeah. again, that's something where I, I, one of the things, you know, you said this earlier and, and, and it comes back to this, um, is this a method for making a new treatment variable or is it, or like is the newspaper method just to make a new treatment variable or is it something to like sort of deal with with messy data and i think it, sometimes it's both sometimes we don't have the treatment right. and sometimes we do um but but yes yeah, so, but that's a question of like the flu is like a question of weeks or months and so if we think it works if we dial up the frequency and we can get meaningful metric you know measures of like this town got the flu in september and this town got the flu in november um, we could, that's awesome. You could do if we that. think it's too noisy, then maybe it's not possible. No, I think, I think you could certainly do the flu. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't get hundred percent coverage, but you could get enough that you could, you, you could get a noisy measure of when the flu arrived to where you could get, I, I think you could learn something. The issue would be, you would have treated places you didn't know were treated. I think you could feel, have some pretty good confidence about uh, about who about your treatment measure capturing actual treatment, but you would have you would have, but that's that's true of anything you're going to use, right? And so you're going to get some atten you're going to get attenuated estimates, but you know, you know that's what that's what we see in the in what I just showed you, and we would have learned what we learned from the map from from the data we had. So when you say when you say you're going to get some some areas that are treated that weren't treated, is that because of directional oh, well, I, I issues? The other way. There are going to be some areas that were yeah that were treated that we will not see as treated because we won't find the newspaper article, okay. or the the, digitiz the digitization of the newspaper article will have you know misdigitized the name of the town in the article, or the word flu will have turned into fly, or right. I mean. I mean, could you potentially have some places that appear to be treated that weren't treated at all? Because, sure. you, know, oh, the, oh. you know, the flu has not yet arrived in Milwaukee. We, we could have the International um, Flu, you know, symposium happened in Allegheny County on Thursday, right? And that would yeah. show up as flu in, in Allegheny County. That's why, you know, these are noisy measures. So, so if you actually had, if you had... If you had RA, RA hours, you could alleviate that to some extent. But you could in one direction. Yeah. With RA hours, I can make false positives go away. 
and it's not crazy expensive to do. And that's a really good point. Um, we can't do the other thing though, really. And you have to sit down and read every newspaper ever ever published, right? So, so your your argument is that that would just so extra RA hours would lead to greater precision of the estimates themselves, but not change their magnitude at all. Oh, it would. I mean, it would probably. It depends again. So, you know, um, we don't have uncorrelated, you know, uh, error in our in our two data sets, right? Which 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 means that. Um, cleaning it up would make the world, if we did, it would be about precision is all, but we don't, right? And so we, in fact, when we're doing the agreement approach, the agreement sample approach, we're probably still attenuated, right, a, a, a bit. And so anything you could do to get rid of a, a, of a false positive would make the estimate probably probably larger. I mean, I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, probably, but, you know, just, just thinking about newspapers themselves, I, you know, so I... I'm thinking like uh, the St. Louis Post Dispatch, right? They serviced Eastern Missouri and Western Illinois, right? That's that's the coverage of the paper, right? They're probably not going to be picked up in Western Missouri, right? Because people buy the Kansas City Star out there. So a lot of the coverage you'll see in the St. Louis Post Dispatch is about what's going on in you know, East St. Louis and some of the, some of the towns and counties on the Illinois side. Yeah. Um, does this matter? I mean, should we think about this at all? In, in, in terms of a bit, uh, for sure. Again, that's why these measures, I, we would never claim that these were not noisy measures. I know I'm saying the same thing over and again, but one thing to think about is we are not talking about the, uh, uh, about the St. Louis dispatch, a new dispatch, right? We are talking largely these data sets are, small county newspapers, um, small newspapers you've never heard of that were around for six years and then they're gone. It's a real, it's a real hodgepodge. So it's, this isn't being driven primarily by large institutional big city newspapers with large coverages. It's more being driven by smaller newspapers with, um, and I think part of that's contractual, right? Uh, newspapers.com has got to get the rights to, to this data after I want to say 19, there's a cutoff here. It's somewhere in the teens uh, before which you get a lot more coverage uh, because uh, because of copyright law, I think. Um, maybe it's 1922 now is the year. I can't remember. There's a, there's a cutoff here, but um, it's largely small newspapers. But yeah, we have to worry about these things. It's, 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 it's really hard to do a lot about them though, really, other than recognize that, that they're an issue and, and try to think about what they mean for your for your estimates. And, you know, the issue about the question about syndication, which I don't think there's much going on with, is an important one there. Are we just seeing, right? We're seeing over again, but then again, right? That syndication question, the economists should probably, if you're seeing the same thing over and over, I don't think that will bias our results per se, right? The issue is, um, you know, correlation between that and the maps. And maybe there is some, in which case we're gonna still seeing attenuation bias. I, I think most of those problems are the bar in terms of the type of noise that we can survive here, I think is, is pretty low, actually, uh, unlike a lot of other settings. Um, because the problem we're trying to solve is a pretty easy problem relative to most like selection problems that we try to confront today. Um, and this intensity question, I keep thinking about that's another interesting thing. You know, and I'd have to think hard about what that means for intensity, right? Intensity, you're kind of in an easier world because you're just using IV, and now the IV, right? Now the IV is unbiased, right? Um, and so, on some levels, the the arrival of the bull weevil is, is not is is a an uphill example for us, kind of, because we have to rely more on the agreement sample, whereas uh, the IV would solve the problem. I think the IV would solve the problem with the intensity with the interaction too. So, or we wouldn't have the interaction, which would be even better. We have have only one. From our perspective, it'd be easier to talk about. So going back to some of the replications you did, um, where you had the you had the um, the dot plots uh, of uh -huh. um, you know essentially uh, cotton production going down, and yeah. you you find a little bit of corn, right? Extra corn, you know the yeah, the the, the twelve, it. right? The twelve regression dot plot. Yeah, I'm pulling that up right now if I can. I'm curious. Do you? I mean, 
essentially, were you getting, you know, it was, it was hard to essentially convert from cotton to corn, right, for these people. So I'm just wondering what it looks like if you were actually there, right? I mean, did you actually, yeah, so, so, so these, right? Yeah. Do you actually see a lot of fields just fallow during these years? Boy, I would guess I really, well, I mean, we can come over here to a number of farms, right? Yeah. According to the estimates, you see a small, I have to go back and look. I can't remember what the, I don't, because this is about method and less about the void. But we, they get no impact on the change of farm acreage at all. We, with, with our method, get a, a slight decrease. And that makes sense because you, um, it's going to take some time for the bull weevil to wipe stuff out. Yeah. Uh, and so I think you see a small but not huge reduction in the acreage and farm. Can you see a reduction probably in farm value, although that's not significant. But this, here we go. You know, you are, this, this is, this is the, I think the continuous measure. So at the 70, 75th percentile of cotton production, right? You're, you're seeing a reduction in number of farms. You're seeing a reduction in farm value that's happening. And, you know, you're, you're seeing, again, you're seeing this switch to cotton, uh, which isn't, isn't that surprising? Although the acreage switch is different, so but they may be going to other they may be going to other other crops other than corn as well. So historically, what happened? I'm not the right. Let me just be quick. <laughs> James knows more about okay. the bull weevil probably than I do. <laughs> I think it was a pretty no, I think it was a pretty good answer. Um, I mean, it, there's a there's also a limit on how much we uh, how do I put this the right way. Um, the agricultural data, the outcomes are perfect. None of this is annual data. And so there's a lot of questions that I think we still can't answer about the precise timing and the precise way these switches worked. Um, but I think Randy did a nice job of, of describing the acre results and, and how his results fit in. So do we do we finally figure out a way to kill off the bull weevil? Is that is that the, the end of this historical story we in did. the 1920s? We did terrible things and grew different cotton, I believe, is the answer to that. We poisoned a lot of land and, and we switched to, is it high cotton or low cotton? I can't remember. We yeah, there's, there's changes in, in varieties. And so I, I think, it, you know, eventually base becomes not such a big deal. Although, I mean, we there's also a big shift in, in cotton growing locations to, to places, you know, irrigation also matters a lot to the story. Um, the places that previously weren't so good for cotton as the tech, other technology improves in addition to the pests not being there. Um, and I think we did, some we did some crazy things in terms of things we used as pesticides and applied poisons to the land. And sometimes some experiment experimentation, right, during these years to try to figure out how to survive. Yeah. That would be sort of interesting to look at, too, um, in this. Well, we're getting short of time. Uh, any last thoughts at all from you, Randy? No, just thank you. This has been great. I really appreciate the opportunity to present the work and I'm uh, super thankful to James for the comments. Any last thoughts, James? No, it's great. I'm, I'm eager to see, to hopefully not see this as a referee. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, I, I, I appreciate Randy and his co-authors putting this together. I think um, I think it'll be a valuable, a valuable input to a lot of future work where, you know, the data is just messy and sometimes we just throw our hands up and, and deal, like live with the fact that our, our estimates are probably attenuated, but I, I appreciate that they actually tried to, to take that on. Okay. Well, thank you both. Thanks to Randy Walsh from the University of Pittsburgh and James Feigenbaum from Boston University. Uh, we're just about out of time here. Uh, thanks to Ann Johnson, who helps me run these pipe workshops uh, at USC. Uh, and thanks to everyone out there who uh, spent some time with us today watching the video and, and will spend some time watching the recording of the video, which will be up in probably about a week or so. So uh, with that, I will bring this workshop to a close. And uh, I hope that uh, you, you all have a good rest of your Tuesday afternoon.